an associate professor of biology at Westminster College. His passion for snakes and lizards began at a young age in the backwoods of Southern Ohio. He knew that to experience the diversity of herps in the US, he would need to travel south. For his graduate work, he studied in East Texas, looking specifically at the behavior of the venomous cottonmouth. His PhD in environmental toxicology came from Texas Tech, where he looked at the effects of cadmium, cadmium and copper on the amphibians and macroinvertebrates. Currently, he teaches classes in evolution, aquatic ecology, and, and aquatic ecology, and most enthusiastically, the herpetology of Utah class. His research with undergraduates continues to look in, at the effects of contaminants on a variety of wildlife, ranging from whiptail lizards on Antelope Island to macroinvertebrates in our mountain streams. So Dave, welcome. Tell us about the herps, herps at Antelope Island. Thank you so much. Um, why don't I start first by sharing my screen? All right. Um, well, it seems incredibly appropriate that you would start with an anecdote about spiders and then I would take over talking about reptiles, uh, the two things to cause the most fear, I believe. And then I'm gonna round it out by uh, public speaking. So we got maybe the top five things to fill everyone with terror. Um, but yeah, thank you so much, Jamie and Bonnie for uh, making this forum um, for us to nerd out on the Great Salt Lake and the Great Salt area, right? Um, so as um, Jamie may have mentioned, this is a chapter as part of the um, Great Salt Lake bio biology book. Um, and coming to Utah some eight years ago, um, I knew I'd be coming to um, an arid environment and with arid environments come usually our scaled friends. And so um, I'm thrilled to talk a little bit about um, the thoughts and um, materials that went into this chapter and then also a little bit of research that I've done um, with students. And so with this talk, I know that I've been given 15 minutes and I'm gonna try really hard to stay within that, um, but I have a lot of really fun things to talk about. Um, we'll start first by bringing everyone to the same, to the same page um, on what herpetology is. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about some biogeography. So how did amphibians and reptiles that we know, know and love, how did they get here? Um, we'll talk more specifically about Antelope Island and then maybe we'll close with a little discussion about um, the future. Uh, so um, what are the effects of maybe changing environments um, and the effects of climate change on our critters? Um, so um, I have the heading here being herpetology as a field of convenience. So herpetology is the study of amphibians and reptiles. And I think on first pass, that seems like an easy, easy um, pairing, right? Um, well, um, herpetology has its root in um, the word to creep. So um, whoever named, you know, herpetology some, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years ago, they didn't um, put these critters off to a, on a good foot. So pretty much we started off by saying, look at those creepy, weird, slimy things. I don't know that if I, I wanna hang out with them, um, but um, we lovingly refer to them as HERPs and you'll see that acronym um, or that abbreviation going for, forward HERPs, meaning anything amphibian and reptile related. Um, but there's a number of things that they do have in common. They're all vertebrates and they're all tetrapods, meaning they all have four limbs. You might be thinking, well, wait a second, snakes don't have four limbs and there are legless lizards and they don't have four limbs and you'd be, you'd be correct. They have only recently lost those legs and their ancestors definitely have those legs. So they're still firmly um, within the realm of tetrapods. Um, they're all also ectotherms, meaning they behaviorally modify their internal temperature. You've likely um, maybe been hiking um, or mountain biking on a trail and you've come around a bend and seen um, a gopher snake laid all the way across the, the trail. And it is most of, the t most of the time it's basking, trying to soak up some of that solar radiation um, so that it can continue um, its day. 
So they're all ectotherms. Um, and then uh, out of this convenience, they all tend to sometimes <laughs> occupy very similar habitats. You can find them in moist areas, under fallen logs and, tr and uh, stones. Um, so if you're trying to find both amphibians and reptiles, oftentimes you can go near a stream and have pretty uh, a decent amount of luck. Um, and this uh, picture right here is a whip tail found on Antelope Island. And this is one of my students who had successfully caught it, which they're quite, quite a challenge to catch freehand. Um, but uh, while there's a number of things that they have in common, they, there's a lot that's very different. Um, for one, reptile skin is made of keratinized scales. In this picture, you can see what's called a heavily keeled scale. They're kind of overlapping like um, roof shingles. Um, amphibian skin, you're probably quite familiar with. It can be moist, smooth, and rough, but it's all semi-permeable, meaning um, amphibians rely on their skin for uh, gas exchange. Um, reptiles are part of the taxonomic group amniotes, meaning they um, have an amniotic egg. Um, their developing embryo is surrounded by a fluid sac called an amnion. And you probably have also seen um, egg laying reptiles that actually produce this leathery or even hard egg. Um, all of this is an evolutionary adaptation to prevent desiccation um, on land. And so conversely, amphibians lack this amniotic egg. You may have um, wandered close to a slow moving body of water and seen this big mass of gelatinous um, uh, structures and those would resemble, or those are potentially um, frog or um, other, other amphibian eggs. So they are directly tied to the aquatic habitat. So even though um, toads, for example, can be found very far away from some sort of aquatic body, they are directly tied or linked. They must go back to some sort of moist habitat to reproduce. So that kind of gives us some context to um, what we're talking about, amphibians and reptiles. It is a field of convenience. They share some things, but then they diverge um, with a number of these uh, traits. Okay, so if we're thinking about um, these organisms in Utah, here's a, a few interesting stats for you. Um, Utah actually ranks 27th out of the, uh, in the US, in herpetolo herpetological diversity. Um, we have 57 reptile species, so that's 10 above the US average. Um, and we have 17 amphibian species, which is well below the um, average of 31. Um, and this isn't particularly surprising. Um, Utah has what's considered to be a low degree of herpetological endemism. Um, which means that the, the organisms that are found in Utah are also found somewhere else. Um, this example that I have here is the Mojave rattlesnake. Um, you know, a, a sliver of its range moves up into the um, southwestern portion of Utah, but then it can be found all the way throughout the Four Corners region. So its range actually expands southerly and westerly, and only a little bit of it extends into Utah. So um, it, so things that are found in Utah are also found elsewhere. And so what that means is uh, the presence of these organisms in Utah is likely the result of a range expansion from somewhere else. Uh, somewhere else. And that's where we're really going to spend um, the next couple slides um, kind of fleshing out. So for amphibians in Utah, <clears throat> they can be grouped among three different origins. Uh, the first one was to arrive from uh, Central or South America, and this would include um, representatives like the Canyon Tree Frog, the Western Chorus Frog, um, and the Great Basin Spadefoot. The second group arrived from the Northwest, or the Pacific Northwest, which was via um, Eastern, or yeah, via um, Eastern Asia, and that would include the Northern Northern Leopard Frog, the Relic Leopard Frog and the Columbia spotted frog. Uh, lastly, we have um, those that arrived from the east. And that would be our um, wonderful tiger salamander. So that one um, came from, uh, from the, the eastern part of the, the Americas. 
and then moved west. You might be thinking to yourself, what about the true toads like our boreal toad or Woodhouse's toad? So they have a little bit more complex story where they actually originated in Central and South America, but they originated so long ago that the land masses were so close together and they um, expanded globally and then came across from Europe to the East Coast and then continued to expand westerly and, and southerly. So um, they have a pretty interesting tour of the entire globe and have representatives that can be found um, in those areas as well. So moving on to reptiles in Utah. So like I mentioned, we have 57 reptiles, 31 of which are snakes, 22 are lizards, and four are turtles. And we're going to follow a similar um, storyline here where they kind of come from three different areas. Um, we have representatives like the thread snake, garter snake, side blotch lizard, and whip tails. They all arose from the south. And when I say the south, I'm saying Mexico, Central, or South America. And then they expanded the range north. Um, we have um, reptiles like the king snake, the gopher snake, and those horned lizards. Um, and this also includes rat snakes and rattlesnakes. These came actually from Asia, dispersed across the landmass to the northwest, and then kept coming eastward and southerly. Um, and then lastly, we have um, our really fast moving predators. Um, like the racers and the coach whips. These actually came from the east, most likely the, the Florida Plateau, um, moved west and kind of, kind of settled in this arid um, environment. Um, and I forgot to mention um, the gopher tortoise actually came from the Great Plains. So it actually evolved and diverged within the Great Plains habitat and then moved just a little bit west. It didn't move very far, only a little bit west. So if we um, kind of increase our resolution to um, Antelope Island, um, there's been a number of surveys over the last couple hundred years, the first one being from um, Captain Stansberry. Um, and when he and his team came through, they found about four or five different um, reptiles and amphibians that we still acknowledge um, today. But over the last um, 20 years, we've had a number of um, sampling efforts that have yielded some really important information. Um, one on Antelope Island specifically was done by Mortensen in 2004. Um, and he largely did active sampling where um, he drew um, 100 to 200 yard transects and then walked essentially the entire extent of Antelope Island, which yielded some really interesting results. Um, in recent years, myself and a number of students have been doing more passive sampling. And passive sampling is where you um, essentially set a trap and then you come back and, um, and check it periodically. Uh, we use what's called a drift fence and pitfall trap. And you can see on the first image on the left, excuse me, this is kind of an overhead view of what you would be looking at where you'd have a drift fence, so some barrier, it can be fabric, it can be um, flashing, aluminum flashing, but it all always terminates into a bucket or some sort of pit. Um, and you can see on the right picture that aluminum flashing actually ends right into a painter's bucket. Um, we, we started using um, a fabric um, fence, but we soon quickly realized that um, we, were, we would just stake out and watch the lizards come by and then just climb up and over the, the fencing and keep going. So that was not going to help us actually funnel them into a trap so that we could take information and let them go. So uh, we then moved on to the, the flashing. And so this project um, was, the reason why I wanted to do this project was I was interested in the, the fate and distribution of mercury in um, these lizards. And um, maybe when we get into the Q&A, we can talk more about that. Um, but in doing so, I, it also allowed me to do some really interesting um, survey work. Um, and it generated a list of um, organisms or a list of reptiles that I actually found on um, Antelope Island within these pitfall traps, it, the drift fence and pitfall trap. And so the list of organisms um, that we can find on Antelope Island, you might guess is actually sands. 
any amphibians. So no amphibians are recorded um, on Antelope Island, but what we do find in quite a bit of numbers are sagebrush lizards, side blotch lizards, great basin whiptails, uh, western yellow-bellied racers, striped whip snakes, great basin gopher snakes, and the wandering garter snake, which is actually um, a new addition from the Mortensen study. So what's, what's really interesting is what isn't there and maybe why it's not there. Um, so within the Great Salt Lake Valley, the Great Basin rattlesnake, the desert horn lizard, and the Great Basin spadefoot can be found in actually fairly decent numbers, um, even right up to um, the, the watershed or the, the Great Salt Lake watershed um, uh, uh, boundary. And so it's kind of, it's really, it's kind of surprising why they're not there. And there might be a few reasons um, why they're not there. One might be that overland dispersal is a direct barrier to getting onto the island. Um, in order to get to the island, they have to go over um, salt flats or through incredibly saline waters. Even those waters that are fresh, like the, the wetlands that we know exist on the um, east side of the, of the lake, um, we know that rattlesnakes, at least the Great Basin rattlesnake, um, they, th those bodies of waters are oftentimes barriers to those types of organisms. Um, and then you might be uh, remembering that in certain years, depending on um, amount of water, we have land bridges. And those land bridges definitely provide um, dispersal for mammals. Um, we know coyotes use them and other, um, other wildlife, but for um, snakes, for lizards, for amphibians, um, those are probably likely to be used by some really hardy species like gopher snakes and, um, uh, and uh, yellow-bellied racers. Um, but for others that are more slow moving, those are essentially are, um, they're just gonna be targets for predators. Um, so these are a couple of reasons why we potentially don't see them there. Um, if the, the Great Salt Lake started to fill back up to kind of historic highs, um, we might see um, uh, opportunities to colonize increase. Um, and so with this last slide, um, I kind of want to bring us back to, um, you know, what's currently happening um, environmentally. So we know that in, um, in the Intermountain West, especially these arid um, ecosystems, that we're going to expect earlier spring snow runoff, declines in snowpack um, in the Rocky Mountain and in Great Basin regions, and then increased frequency duration um, of uh, drought events. So that's something that we can all say uh, with a fair amount of predictive power is going to happen. Um, for the most part, uh, researchers suggest that this is going to promote a decline in biodiversity in population sizes. Um, on Antelope Island, it might be a little bit different. So, um, this uh, slide sh says whiptail lizards versus uh, side blotch lizards. The timing of reproduction is super important uh, because whiptail lizards actually reproduce most often in the warmer months of the season, whereas side blotch lizards are a little bit earlier in the season. So as temperatures increase, um, we're likely to see that those warmer months start to hit into um, the more extreme range of temperature tolerance for the whiptail lizards whereas the side blotch lizards probably have a wider range of tolerance because they're reproducing in the cooler months. So we might not actually see this sudden decline in overall population sizes or populations in general, but we might see a shift in um, the, the community and what that looks like. That might then also influence vegetation and other insects in the area. So the, uh, the story is a little bit more complicated and honestly interesting, which is, why we need to continue doing these surveys on Antelope Island and in the greater um, Intermountain West. So I believe with that, here are some references and picture credits. I'll stop sharing and um, turn it back over to Jamie. Thank you, Dave.